more than 100 years, Fort George G. Meade has been a major military presence in Anne Arundel County. It is home to the U.S. Cyber Command, the National Security Agency, the U.S. Army, and the Defense Information Systems Agency, among 117 partner organizations. With more than 52,000 employees, it is the largest employer in the state of Maryland. But Fort Meade was not always a powerhouse of cyber technology and intelligence. It began as Camp Meade, while America hastily prepared to enter the First World War. Before the military came to town, there was barely a town to speak up outside of Annapolis and Baltimore. There were lots of peach farms and one-horse towns. In this part of western Anne Arundel County, there wasn't, there wasn't very much development. Uh, the principal features were the, the railroads running through here that connected Annapolis to the main line north-south. And there were a couple of little towns, and they were post offices and a, and a cluster of houses, so even calling them a town was, is probably too much. The people in the area uh, were truck farmers. They sent fruits and vegetables to the markets in, in Baltimore and Washington. The families that lived here were, were familiar names to the area, uh, the Clarks, the Disneys, um, the Friedhofers, uh, Sauerhammers, names that you continue to see on street signs and, and so on. The namesake of Fort George G. Meade came from a Union hero who fought in the decisive battle of Gettysburg that ended up being the turning point in the Civil War. The general commanding the Army of the Potomac had been on the job for only two days. General Meade is a forgotten hero. He is, after all, the winner of the Battle of Gettysburg, the great cataclysm, the changing of the tide, the high water mark for the Confederacy, but the clear point where the war will be won by the Union. He's overshadowed by Grant in later campaigns, but his earlier career is just as important as his Gettysburg. Came out of Pennsylvania, career military officer, fought in the Virginia campaigns, including the peninsula, had the great honor of commanding the Pennsylvania Reserves, good brigade officer, excellent divisional officer, excellent corps commander, and just before the Great Battle of Gettysburg, is promoted to the Army of the Potomac commander. Camp Meade was established as a cantonment, meaning it had no real buildings with foundations. It is notable that the camp was named after a Union general, while other southern camps were named after Confederate generals. Make your mother proud of you and the old red, white, and blue. Camp Meade was born as the war to end all wars raged in Europe. The Civil War had ended only two generations earlier in 1865. It remains the bloodiest war in U.S. history, and at the time, Americans were in no mood to fight again. When German attacks in the Atlantic grew in the so-called Zimmerman telegram, raised the specter of Mexico, becoming an ally of Germany, Woodrow Wilson had no choice but to declare war. America's answer to the threat from abroad, the threat of the German armies, also becomes more vigorous in the summer of 1918. Doubts of national conscience, fears about security, are dimmed by triumphant scenes from the Western Front. Enter a man named John Charles Linthicum, a Maryland state senator and later congressman. He was first to introduce a bill making the Star Spangled Banner the official national anthem. And he even co-wrote an important amendment that led to the repeal of prohibition in 1933. But he is widely credited with the vision to bring Fort Meade to Maryland. He and a group of businessmen estimated $20 million in benefits could accrue to the state if one of these containment areas was put in, in Maryland. Uh, so they put together their, their best uh, equivalent of PowerPoint for the day and work with the uh, War Department to tout why Maryland, 22 miles uh, from the port of Baltimore, close to Washington, D.C., so the VIPs could come up and check out the training for themselves. Two major rail lines feeding into a junction at Annapolis Junction and you know, a central location. Uh, not a lot of population, so less turmoil than, than other places might have represented. The push to war began in earnest. 
Wilson sought to build an army of two million soldiers from a standing army of only about 100,000. The draft was established and the American Doughboy was born. More than 500,000 soldiers would pass through Camp Meade during World War I. What does a 17 or an 18 or a 19 year old know about war? We had in our institutional memory as a country the Civil War. No one was prepared, even the officers training, for what they were going to see in the battlefields of Europe during World War I. The officers were still being trained in our academies in Napoleonic style tactics. And they were thrown into a new environment where technology reigned. World War I really started war as we know it today with sophisticated machinery. So these young men were excited and, and listened to the recruiters and joined up because they were patriotic and they had no idea what they were going to see in the battlefields overseas. World War I might have been the beginning of a new era of technology and warfare, but you wouldn't know it from visiting Camp Meade. The car was still a pretty new thing, with the Ford Model T going into production in 1908. That meant that Meade was home to a whole lot of horses. You could have seen up to 12,000 horses there at one time, and that meant 6,000 bales of hay per day. There was a remount station uh, that was established at Camp Meade for the Army to procure horses and mules from all of the surrounding areas and prepare for shipment to France because Artillery pieces tended to be horse or mule drawn. Uh, they were still using wagons uh, and that kind of thing. It was still a role for horses and mules in the, in the Army. Our Camp Meade was one of the main assembly points in, in the Mid-Atlantic uh, for livestock uh, to support the, the Army operations. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge logistics challenge to deal with that. Uh, the, the men that were training at Camp Meade in the 79th Division struggled with a lack of equipment. Uh, they didn't have rifles. There weren't sufficient rifles to give to the troops, so initially they drilled with, with wooden staves, um, pretending they were rifles. Uh, there were wooden mock-ups of machine guns and wooden mock-ups of artillery pieces. Um, so it wasn't until really 1918 that sufficient uh, weapons began to arrive at Camp Meade to support more realistic training. Men weren't the only ones heading off to war from Camp Meade. Women were also there as a part of the Signal Corps. They were called Hello Girls because their job was to operate the switchboards on the Western Front. More than 7,000 women applied, but only 450 were accepted to serve overseas. They were trained at Camp Meade. The Hello Girls were the first women who were inducted into the United States Army. The preponderance of them came here once Camp Franklin was built, the Signal Corps School that was here on Camp Meade, and about 425 ladies came through Camp Franklin to get their basic training. And they were given rank. So uh, first lieutenant got the same amount of money that a male lieutenant, which was $33 a month, out of which she had to pay for her own uniform. They had to speak English and French, so there were special requirements that they had to meet that any doughboy didn't. They also had to have switchboard experience, telephone switchboard, and they also could never have been married. The Army didn't want to induct any divorcees or widows that might have children because a lot of these ladies served right on the front. Grace Benker was one of the most famous Hello Girls because she was the chief operator, worked for President Wilson, and received a Distinguished Service Medal for her actions, which included leading her team through trenches with gas masks and working out of bombed out buildings on the front. They were put in harm's way because French operators simply wouldn't work. The French had operators, and the French women were a bit snooty, and when an American officer couldn't speak perfect French. Je coupe, I cut you off. So that's how they got that nickname, the Hello Girls, because when an officer got through and he heard an American voice, he kept going, hello? And it's like, oh, a Hello Girl. That's how they got the name. They were so excited to have an American voice on the other end. <laughs>
On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the war was over less than two years after the United States had entered. So after World War I, we created a tank corps in France. We wanted to keep that, uh, but we hadn't had that before the war. So the question was, well, what do we do with all this, these tanks and the soldiers that have learned how to operate them and, and fight with them and so on? And Camp Meade was selected as the home of the tank corps. The officer left in, in France uh, to bring all the tanks together uh, and ship them back to the United States it was Patton. Um, Patton had, had distinguished himself with the tank corps uh, during World War I before he was wounded. But he recovered from his wound and, and oversaw that and brought the tanks back to, to Camp Meade and set up the tank corps under the command of Brigadier General Rockenbaugh. Later history would bring together two giants of American warfare in politics, George Patton and Dwight D. Eisenhower. In 1921, you might not have foreseen Ike becoming President of the United States. He never got to see any action in World War I. He spent most of the war stateside leading training operations. Patton, on the other hand, was commander of the 304th Tank Brigade in the war and was battle tested. And it's actually here that they met for the first time. They knew of each other, but they met here and they formed a deep friendship, in part because they were thrown together. Back then, we provided a house and it was a duplex for the officers. So Eisenhower and Patton were put next to each other in an officer duplex right here on Camp Meade. Patton and Eisenhower became really good friends, but they grew up in very different families. You would think the man who would become president would come from the rich family and cultured upbringing. It was actually quite the opposite. Patton was the American blue blood everywhere he went. He brought a string of 12 polo ponies with him. Eisenhower, son of a Kansas sod farmer, phew, threw them together. Imagine how much they had in common, like zip other than loving the army and seeing the future for tanks. Patton himself believed in offense, offense, offense. He wrote a saber manual for pe when people very rarely fought with swords. As a cavalry officer, he did not want to teach the soldiers to parry or block, only attack. If you line up your attack properly, you will be protected behind it. If the guy sees your attack vigorously enough, he will only think to defend himself, and you won't have to defend yourself. That was his sword concept. So, when a vulnerable horse and rider could instead be inside an armored fighting vehicle, Patton was thrilled. He was one of the first proponents of armored warfare for the United States. This four foot long panoramic photo taken at Camp Meade in 1920 tells us so much about the period. If you look really closely, you can see the young officers who would make history together and the British and French tanks that laid the groundwork for the Shermans that were a staple of World War II. You can also study the sea of the young soldiers prepared to fight for the greatest army on earth. And actually that panoramic picture uh, was right outside my office at the post headquarters when I was in command. So I walked by it every day and I, I used to look at the faces that were there and Patton and Eisenhower are striking and, and they stand out, it's like, yeah, there they are. But there's other figures in there. There's, there's one soldier that doesn't look like he's any older than 12 or 13 that's there. Uh, then you get the grizzled ones and there's, there's just a, a wide assortment of faces. And I kept looking because in those panoramic pictures, um, as they shot those, the camera moved slowly across the way, and there's legends of troops on the one end racing and getting in the picture twice. Uh, and I kept looking for a face that, that showed that, and I, I never found one. The period at Camp Meade between World War I and World War II was a time of quiet expansion. In 1929, the Army designated the post as Fort George G. Meade. It wasn't until a day that forever lives in infamy.
that Fort Meade would have to stand up again. December 7th of 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and President Franklin Roosevelt declared war the next day. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Fort Meade during World War II was huge compared to the previous war conflict. This time, more than three and a half million men came through its gates on their way to war. It also became a prisoner of war camp to house Italian and German prisoners, and even launched a special unit to boost the morale of American soldiers. Old friends Patton and Eisenhower would get a chance to use their well-honed ideas fighting the Nazis in World War II. It was the most important battle in world history. It was called Operation Overlord. Patton had fallen out of favor after an incident where he slapped a soldier, but his friend Eisenhower trusted him. He assigned Patton to a false army in England. They built balloon tanks, tree artillery, set up tents with no one in them, and the Germans, whose air reconnaissance was more limited than it had been, got hints of Patton's army across from the city of Calais, and they believed that America's greatest combat commander would be the leader of the invasion. So they prepared to defend across from where Patton was stationed, and we landed in Normandy instead. D-Day is one of the most significant military operations, not only of World War II, but in man's experience. Wartime was a boom period for advertising in America. Vintage posters promoted the war effort and big stars helped build morale among the troops. Fort Meade created the Special Services Unit Training Center, where enlisted personnel learned music, entertainment. There was a hint of glitz and glamour to go along with the harsh realities of war. The school was actually in two halves. There was a civilian half and a military half. But both schools trained entertainers to entertain the troops overseas. And not only did we train them how to entertain the troops, but we equipped them to entertain the troops overseas. So, so a sergeant that was in the special services school for the military, he might be issued a kit, like a sports kit would have enough baseball bats and baseball mitts and gloves so that a unit overseas could be sent this sergeant with the kit and they could play baseball in their downtime. And on the civilian side, we didn't just let anyone go over on a ship by themselves and say, I'm here, I want to entertain the troops. They might say something that would actually demoralize our, our men and women overseas. So we had to kind of help them and escort them and provide for them. We provide their, their, for their movements through the troops with escorts and, and quartermaster support and transportation support. But we also help them to know what to say or do to raise the morale of the troops most effectively. And some of the big names that pass through here, like Don Knotts was here, but he wasn't known as the comedian we all know from the TV show. He was a ventriloquist in World War II. All the starlets, you name them, they were here. So Marlena Dietrich, we have photos of Marlena Dietrich and all the officers fawning over to assist her wherever she went. <laughs> And we had Glenn Miller pass through here. Now we kind of annoyed Glenn Miller. If you read his biography, he wasn't too happy at Camp Me because the Army was going to teach Glenn Miller rhythm. We sat him in a, in a room and said, follow the bouncing ball. Well, he got up, made a phone call to his friend Hap Arnold, and the Army Air Corps said, yep, we'll give you a band. Come on over to the Army Air Corps, and the rest is history. Throughout its history, Fort Meade mirrored many of the social injustices placed on women and minorities. The famous Hello Girls did not receive honorable discharges and veteran status until 1978, 
Black soldiers served in support roles such as laborers and attendants. Nonetheless, more than 350,000 African Americans served on the Western Front in World War I and 125,000 in World War II. Notable groups included the Harlem Hellfighters in the First World War and the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. So we had a, a separate but equal camp. And interestingly, just like that saying, the other side of the tracks, the African-American camp was right near Camp Meads Railroad because very often they were relegated to stevedore work, backbreaking work, the hard, the hard work. And th that was just the way it was. What was sad was the African Americans who joined the army to prove themselves, to show they were just as patriotic, just as willing to fight for their country as any Caucasian was. And it was the army and its institutional mindset that just didn't recognize that and kind of kept them often, not always, but often in these um, manual labor jobs. They served their nation. They served it effectively. They served it well. But in World War II, there was another attitude that particularly affects how African Americans at Fort Meade operated. And that was that many black units were placed in service roles, supply, cooking, the transportation of goods and services. The terrible explosion out on the West Coast caused so many African American casualties because they were the ones handling the munitions and without adequate equipment to do so. So serving at Fort Meade meant serving in a southern state with racial attitudes reflected in the nation and enduring all of those terrors, but all at the same time thinking that it should be otherwise because these black men, too, were serving their country. It's an unfortunate experience, but I would go further and say that it's an invaluable experience because those soldiers in those places did good work, and they were recognized by people like Eisenhower and Truman for their real value as soldiers and citizens, and Truman took the dramatic step of desegregating the military. Fort Meade became home to a prisoner of war camp to capture Italian and German troops. Of course, Meade was nothing like POW camps we are accustomed to, or like the Japanese internment camps where prisoners lived in cramped and substandard conditions. Most of the prisoners, about 1,632, were Italian. Here at Fort Meade, they happened to be close to a thriving Italian-American community in nearby Baltimore. Let's face it, after all, they're in Maryland. They're not going back to fight and they know it. But their experience here for prisoners of war is generally rated as fairly positive. There was a very substantial Italian-American population in Baltimore who brought them baskets of food, who arranged leave for their Italian relatives to come and visit Baltimore and then check back in to the camp. So it was a prisoner of war camp, but conditions were fairly good. There was no chance that the base would be bombed. There were no shortages of food as there were in enemy war camps. And our attitude towards prisoners of war is always one of respect and care, unlike the Asian tradition, for instance, where we get the march to Bataan and the slaughter of prisoners of war. Our attitude is to sustain them. The Second World War ended in August of 1945, known as VJ Day or Victory Over Japan. Germany had surrendered in April. Estimates are that 20 million soldiers died, including 420,000 Americans. The biggest event that ushered in the modern era at Fort Meade happened in 1957 when the National Security Agency came to town. NSA is known locally as no such agency for the classified nature of its operation. NSA was established to perform national signals intelligence work for both the National Command Authority and the new Department of Defense. Up until that time, each of the military services had their own signals intelligence capabilities and units. What they weren't good at doing was sharing across the services what they were collecting in a seamless way.
So uh, Truman decided that, that he needed a, an agency that would pull all that together and perform that work all under, the, under DOD. So plans began in 1954 and 1957. The National Security Agency began operations in Fort Meade. And probably at the time, nobody realized what a dramatic event that was. Prior to that, because of our past history in World War I of being the armor school, where we were near a port, we were still armor in that during Operation Gyroscope, we would collect armor here, train here, and then the men would get on ships and go do Eastern border guard duty. So from the whole Cold War, all during Operation Gyroscope, we had armor here. But when NSA came, we kind of changed. We had the last armor leave for Vietnam in 1971, and from that point on, we were really intelligence gathering, analysis, and today, we're the, the Army and the nation's premier center for intelligence. The rest, as they say, is history. Fort Meade has been evolving ever since the establishment of the NSA. A move was made to locate the Library of Congress on post in 2009, as well as the U.S. Cyber Command. Indeed, in today's world, acts of terror could come not only from a few extremists in suicide vests, but from a few keystrokes on the computer a weapon of mass disruption. So if you go on Fort Meade today, it's a place where cyber, intelligence, and communications all come together in a, in a remarkable hub. Fort Meade is, is the center of, of where it is, and it's a unique national asset that's here that probably represents about $15 billion of economic activity. Again, that's hard to get an exact fix on because of the classified nature of a lot of the work. But from Congressman Linthicum's projection of $20 million of economic activity for Camp Meade to today with 15 to $20 billion of economic activity and the way it's transformed this region. I think the hopes and aspirations of Linthicum and his group have been more than realized. Over the course of a century, Fort Meade has grown from a haphazard tent city, risen from open fields and little railroad villages to the pinnacle of U.S. national defense. It trained switchboard operators during World War I and housed the friendship of a general and future president. It was the jumping off point for millions of U.S. soldiers who went off to defeat the Fuhrer. And in the invention of new agencies that would change the world through intelligence gathering and cybersecurity. Today's Fort Meade is a critical part of our nation's military. It is also a part of our history. You can find out more about Fort Meade on our YouTube page, which has bonus material featuring extended interview footage with our experts.